Hello and welcome to the Exchange for Media OTT Summit. My name is Mayank Shekhar and I'm going to have a hard time actually introducing my guest today for a simple fact that if I just read out his CV, it will be longer than the conversation we're supposed to have, which is about 20 to 25 minutes. To keep it short, he's an animation pioneer of sorts, bringing the East to the West, just when you thought the two could not meet. He's, of course, best known here for Legend of Hanuman, the animation series on Hotstar plus Disney, also for the Baubal animation series that you can catch on Amazon Prime Video. I could just go on and on, but I'll go straight to the person here. Ladies and gentlemen, Sharad Devrajan. Thank you so much, Sharad, for joining us. Well, thank you. What an honor to be here and to, to be speaking with you. So thank you, everyone. Yeah. You know, I have to say, uh, while I could have read your CV, and there's, there's so much material out there in terms of delving deeper and deeper into stuff that you've done professionally, especially in the space of animation. I just thought maybe it's a good idea for the audiences to know you a little bit more personally in terms of where you were raised, uh, yeah. where you were born. How did you get into animation uh, in the first place? Well, I, that, that's, that's very kind of you. My story is not as nearly as exciting as the stories I try to create, but I'll give, I'll give the best I can. I mean, uh, you know, I was, I was fortunate. I grew up in, uh, in, in the States, in New Jersey. My father had, uh, you know, uh, come from India, from, uh, from Chennai over to, to the U.S., and I was born here and had such an appreciation for the arts that I had grown up my entire life wanting to be an artist and was fortunate enough that, you know, comic books, I always say, were my escape to the universe. I grew up in a town where I was probably the only Indian growing up. And I remember I was always trying to reconcile, you know, these amazing mythological stories that I had grown up on and that had shaped so much of my life, the myths that we know, uh, you know, as well as found myself drawn to all of the world of superheroes from Stan Lee and others and the creators there. And those really shaped my worldview of bringing those ideas together in my mind at a very young age. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, you know, I found I went to school as a painter. I studied painting as an undergraduate and, uh, you know, went off and post that right after undergraduate, ended up starting my first company, which was bringing, uh, you know, Marvel Comics and DC Comics out to the Asian markets in a company I started called Gotham Comics at the time. And from there, you know, was fortunate enough to start this entire comic book journey, which has always been my passion of bringing together great writers, artists, creators. We founded uh, Virgin Comics at the time, post that mm -hmm. with my good friends, Gotham Chopra, Deepak Chopra, Shekhar Kapoor, uh, uh, and, you know, Suresh Sitharaman, where we really tried to bring together a whole vision of young creators, artists all across India to transform the perception of India from being an outsourcer to a source. And comics were the medium by which we really tried to do that and bring those to people around the world. Uh, and that's been the continued mission of Graphic India, which we formed, you know, obviously a number of years back. But to push that boundary again in a level where we can also say that, you know, the next Spielberg, Miyazaki, the next, uh, you know, J.K. Rowling, the next creators, they're all sitting somewhere here in this country, in India, oh. ready to transform the world with their stories. So could we provide them that home? And for me, comic books have always been one of the richest tapestries since we were cavemen painting on the cave walls, we have told stories in pictorial sequential form in comic books. So, you know, I look at it as one of the purest mediums, which is a movie with an unlimited budget, a way where you can level the playing field of creativity. And so we were fortunate that some of the great artists we have seen through the years that I've worked with Jeevan Kang, you know, Mukesh Singh, Abhishek Singh, uh, Edison George, all of them coming from India to really I think spark a revolution of storytelling in this medium. Uh, and, and the writers as well have been so amazing that we've been have the good fortune to work with. But the goal of Graphic India is we always say we're not a comic company, we're a storytelling company. And storytelling is going through such profound, you know, change in distribution, but the core elements remain the same. And our mission has been to take you into a place of wonder. You know, that's the core of every story we try to do and how we've always looked at the world. But, you know, that's something that uh, that continues to drive us to this day in animation as we move into live action, as we move into the metaverse. Uh, right. All of it really comes into all of those dimensions of creating great story. Well, of course, we'll get into uh, metaverse uh, at some <laughs> point for sure. That's, that's the buzzword these days in any case. But, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, bringing a comic series onto the screen and, of course, technology has a huge part to play in it. Uh, Shara, then you know anybody who's ever watched anything that is huge from from Hollywood, and if they stick around for too long uh, in the closing credits, you you begin to see a lot of Indian names and a lot of Indian companies. Um, really? Is that are they doing what would be like grunt work really when it comes to Hollywood? Are they actually doing what is uh, is our advantage in that area 
essentially cheap labor? Is that what we've been traditionally been good at when it comes to big scale, the big screen uh, animation? So that's a, that's a very interesting question, right? I mean, and certainly our our vision of our studio was that we would never do outsourcing work, right? Because we think that, you know, it's very hard to balance both 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 sides of life. So if you're an outsourcing studio, you really are dealing with clients, you're dealing with trying to really, you know, and, and nothing to take away from it. The amazing creativity that still comes from all of those studios is unbelievable. Some of the best talents from India have worked on some of the best films in producing those visions that need to come and become a reality, right? So, so even the outsourcing work, you know, is, is done at calibers out of India that is beyond anything being done in the world today. That being said, our vision was if you looked at IP companies, if you looked mm -hmm. at people like Marvel or Pixar, you know, it's very rare you'll see them do outsourcing work because they have to live, breathe, die in the risk of creativity. And, you know, to create a culture of risk is also to take a culture of fear. And, you know, you have to get beyond that fear to go sometimes to the levels of, you know, we're going to live and die if we can create a great story or not. And so, so we wanted to make sure that the DNA of the company could focus on, you know, ultimately that, that spark of, of moving beyond what I'd say the technical technician side of the work, right. which, and really focusing on the intellectual property, the creative spark that can come into what is story and how do we kind of think about that. So a lot of our, our DNA as a company has really been around, let's go for it. You know, let's take the risks that no one is willing to do in the comic. And certainly with animation, I would say we were very fortunate that uh, Rajamali trusted us, you know, SS Rajamali trusted us with Bahubali uh, to work with him to really try and transcend, you know, that was one of the first animated series that we launched, which we wanted to say, let's try to do something not just for kids. Let's let's we could it would have been easy to try and make a young version of Bahubali, which we still think is a very amazing idea. But the first 71 episodes we wanted to do was, you know, let's take the, the world people fell in love with in the film and try and tell an animated series that stays true to that emotional connect and can be that four quadrant, you know, animated series that appeals to people much older and, you know, much wider. And, you know, that, that journey continued with Legend of Hanuman, which I always say, you know, the, the, that, that show is such a success primarily because of Lord Hanuman, right? And our collective love that we have for his journey and his character and, you know, just his story, right? Lord Hanuman's story was an inspiration to me growing up as a child. But the real part of his story that was so inspiring to me was the story we tried to tell here, which was the story of the character, you know, the story of a God who forgot he was a God and mm -hmm. almost had to go through this journey of wisdom and acceptance and finally was ready for that power of immortality. And so that duality of what immortality can do is immortality can corrupt, as we saw with Robin, if it has no anchor to really kind of be there, or it can elevate as it does with Hanuman when he has the anchor of Ram in his life. So, you know, we wanted to really tell that story in a way where we could show the duality of one person's obsession to try and get immortality in Ravan, but ultimately finding that that obsession was what really made him numb in the end, because having found it, he found nothing afterwards and descended. And whereas with Hanuman, once he finally attained immortality, he finally attained a true sense of what it meant. And it, it, eternal doesn't mean eternal life. In the, it doesn't mean living forever. Eternal is a state of being. So, you know, I think that all of these kind of profound wisdoms that were there in the original teachings, we wanted to find a way to make it very accessible and not do it just for kids. So we were so, you know, just overjoyed that the kind of response for Legend of Panama and to a large credit because of the amazing marketing and push and distribution and partnership we had with Disney Plus Hotstar was to, for the first time, launch a streaming show that was the first animated original. And for the first time in the country to position it as not just for kids, but something that can appeal to anybody. And, you know, have that same four quadrant storytelling a Marvel franchise would have, you know, that, that, that and, and the, I think the, the sort of reaction we saw from the audience and you know, the connection they had with it, hopefully will transcend now and allow for a lot of other types of animation like this to start to move into the marketplace. Right. I mean, of course, India itself is a huge market and in general, entertainment has been perceived as, you know, as something that we create for local audiences anyway. But do you think the OTT platforms have changed that? Usually, in the sense that distribution is not an issue anymore. And so when you have something out on a Netflix or, or a Hotstar or even an Amazon Prime video for that matter, it goes directly to 190 countries, 200 countries. So the chances of, say, for instance, a Bahubali being watched across the world is much higher now than it's ever been before, thanks to the internet. 
Absolutely. I think, you know, the, the success of something like Squid Games would have never happened right. 10 years ago, right? So, you know, the fact that we've had, I always say that we grew up on a generation, we have to understand there's two big macro trends that have taken place, right? The first macro trend in all of media, I say, is, you know, in my, my thought is that first, everyone wants to be in everyone's business, right? So if you've got gaming companies making films, toy companies making movies, everyone, mm. which was originally, they were in very select silos of media or mm. entertainment. And doing those things and licensing or figuring out ways to partner with everyone else, now you have everyone kind of moving into everyone's platform and everyone moving to everyone's business model, right? So everyone wants to be in everyone's business. And the only other truth is that everyone wants to be in everyone's country, right? So you've got an essential global land grab that's been taking place, both with investments of media companies around the world from different partners. And think about what happens when, you know, whether it be a Japanese company makes an investment in a US company or an Indian company or an Indian company makes an investment there. You're also bringing different types of best practices, different types of boards, different types of people now that are coming together and trying to transform the content process, how we make content, how we think about content, and how we do it. So if you look at it in the old, if, you, if everyone wants to be in everyone's business and everyone wants to be in everyone's country, you know, the only truth is that if the old adage was content is king, you know, then multi-platform global content is God. Right. <laughs> and that's the type of content that has made the Marvel franchises so successful, that has made, you know, stories like what we like to live in, which is take you into a place of wonder stories, so successful because from Boston to Beijing to Bangalore, people can connect with this journey to take you into someplace other than your world. And so, you know, I think that we'll see a lot more of that type of content. I think that, uh, you know, uh, we look and study some of the macro story trends that have happened too. We think that most of, you know, the Marvel films have dealt with a theme that's probably more universal, which is dysfunctional family. I mean, you can almost come to the core of almost every Marvel film and see it's it's at the core, it's a dysfunctional family, whether it's Guardians of the Galaxy, The Avengers, you know, whether it's, you know, essentially kind of uh, uh, even as simple about Thor, about two brothers and a returned sister and a father, it, you know, almost every story has the theme of dysfunctional family, which is incredibly relatable, incredibly relatable to people because they can identify with that kind of dynamic in their lives. They can identify if they're in any part of the world. And so I think the romantic love story that drove superhero stories, you know, generations before has been transcended to something that is actually, you know, much more universal and relatable. And I think that, again, as we look at the sort of big media companies, whether it be a Netflix or a Disney, uh, you know, they, they've become global multi-platform distribution marketing machines. And what feeds the machine is incredible IP at the center, intellectual property that can speak to all of that. And so, so more and more, I think that will start to happen. And we feel we're at the forefront of unlocking all of what India has had to offer with such immense creativity for so long. We, we have so many genre creators, you know, people that, that, that are in this country that, that are, you know, far beyond what, is, what, it, what, it, what budgets have allowed in the past. And, you know, and I think that's going to be the next wave. And so hopefully all the comics and graphic novels that we've given them a playground to tell those stories in, we see those as great IPs to evolve into all of this universe going forward and be very fresh to the world. Right. I mean, there's of course the, the certain myths that the OTT business, uh, the OTT platform business really broke when it came to global audiences. We always assume that people do not watch foreign language entertainment, which is clearly not the case, right? You take a Squid Game, or for that matter, you take someone, something like a Narcos, we forget this actually Spanish uh, in, in its original language. Second, we thought that people don't watch for too long. You know, just keep it simple, keep it short. But clearly people binge for hours uh, on end. Now, when it came to Hollywood, right, uh, uh, Shah, just take me through how easy or difficult is it for the reverse pollination to take place. There is, yeah. for instance, Spider-Man that is as big as it gets when it comes to India, right? They, it is the biggest grocer in Indian box office. But could there ever be, a, say, a Hanuman uh, in, in America, which could be a huge grocer coming from India? How difficult do you think or, or how easy do you think that is going to be the case? Well, I think the timing has never been better for this moment, right? Now, what I would say is like the other thing that I've noticed is a big trend that the Squid Games moment could have never happened if we didn't have a generation that grew up. So I remember, you know, very early in my career meeting the producer, one of the producers of Scooby-Doo, and he made this comment to me that, you know, kids like it simple. You got to wrap it up in 22 minutes. You got to wrap it up quick take off the mask, it's the bad guy, keep it very straightforward. And I, just, I kept wondering, you know, is that really the case? Are we really trying to dumb it down? Why? Kids are, you know, and you suddenly had a generation that grew up on Pokemon, 
you know, uh, Dragon Ball Z, Yu-Gi-Oh, the most complex narratives with hundreds of characters that were foreign and completely not even, you know, based on U.S. names. If that, and those were huge successes, right? Huge successes around the world and proved that long form episodic narratives with big worlds and massive characters that were completely foreign could appeal at a very young age to kids. And guess what? Those kids grew up. And when they grew up watching and being exposed to that type of content, a Squid Games is a perfect, natural way to watch and engage with content. Korean dramas, international content, they're not the generation before that was, you know, had to have everything kind of handed in their language in a way that they could live with. They grew up very naturally in a world that allowed for that. You know, they're in a world where they have friends around the world on Facebook and they can interact in the world in a very seamless way. So, so, I, so I think that that generational shift has allowed for this moment where the platforms have come together and now capitalized on that moment in a true way. So now more than ever, yes, I, we are doing very big projects on a global level that are tied to Indian myths. And, you know, these are for TV and film and, you know, tied to the stories that, that really, again, would transform the perception of the world and should if they're brought out there and, and are as accessible as anything else. Uh, but they've never had the budgets, the quality, the ability to push them, the marketing machines behind them. You know, growing up in the West, I was always fascinated with why there's so much obsession with the Greek myths. When we're sitting with some of the greatest stories of human creation that are, you know, living and active and teach us about ourselves. So, you know, so, so I think, you know, way beyond an avatar and, you know, even beyond a, a, a Star Wars, which really deals with so many Eastern themes, the force itself is, you know, one of these concepts that the world resonates towards, but is all about, you know, some of the Eastern traditions that we've had in our own cultures, right? So it's time we reclaim and take all of those the, the things that are with us and make these things with the spectacle uh, that they should be seen to the world. Yes. But I mean, was that the reason you went with something like a chakra? Uh, you know, got, you got Stanley to make chakra, which is essentially the Eastern idea of chakras inside our body and the energy uh, that we uh, seek from within. Is, is that what you were trying to do with chakra as well? Yeah, well, you know, I, I always say that well, first Stan was a mentor for 20 years and he was an amazing human being who, you know, I learned so much from. And just as everything you imagined of Stanley, when you mm. see him on the screen as being that type of guy, he mm. was. So it's, it's very rare in life you meet a person that lives up to the myth and the hype that he really is. But And working with him to create Chakra was like being asked to paint a painting with Da Vinci, right? Like it was one of the greatest moments of my life. But the, the theme we both had with it was, could we take the ideas? He was very uh, into Eastern themes. He had obviously mm -hmm. Doctor Strange and many of his characters, he's explored those things. But he had, he had read the Upanishads, he'd you know read many wow. of the Eastern traditions, right? Really? He, read the, he had, you know, Stan was a seeker. And, you know, having that foundation uh, was, was amazing. So we would talk in a way where the theme of something like Chakra was still to create a modern day superhero that would bring together the ideas of East and West through the language of superheroes, which is something that he believed were the fairy tales of our world was our generation, was, you know, these, these great stories that would connect because of what superheroes are. And we've seen that with his legacy of work. But yes, the idea of, you know, creating a technology suit that can activate the chakras, the ideas of East and West, and the ideas of, you know, activating a chakra doesn't necessarily mean you have the wisdom to understand it. So, you know, there's a difference between power and the wisdom to wield power. And those were the themes that, you know, even in Hanuman, we explored, those are the themes that we explore in our traditions you know, profoundly, I think. So, so those were ideas that, you know, Stan and I were grappling with in that story. And the start of Chakra was the graphic novel. We're obviously working on a live action production of that now. And, you know, I want to make sure that character always lives up to the legacy of, you know, the, the 10 plus years Stan and I worked on that character together mm -hmm. to do different things with it. Yeah. And there's, of course, the, the Indian Spider-Man, right? Uh, <laughs> Abhitra yeah. Prabhakar, is that, is that right? Abhitra um, Prabhakar, yes, that's, yes. that's right. Fascinating that you would take Spider-Man bring him to Bombay, make him Indian. Um, take us through that story. Whatever happened to that? Yeah, well, you know, that was very early in my journey. And, you know, it was in, a, in I think, 2004 or five. Mm -hmm. We were fortunate that, you know, the, that it was still in the Sam Raimi Marvel kind of Spider-Man Spider -Man original series. And, you know, the Marvel team, we went to them with this wild idea of really a belief that I've always had that, you know, th that a character like Spider-Man mm -hmm. really represents this beautiful thing where if you can take off that mask, and it's an Indian under the mask. And he's there dealing with local problems as he is in New York City, dealing with local problems here. So could we, instead of translating the comics, which we were already doing as Marvel's partner in the region, could we transcreate? 
could we come up with this concept where we took the essence and authenticity of what the Spider-Man real character was, which was about with great power comes great responsibility. Right. And could we take that and reinvent the character as Pavitra Prabhakar? Of course, this has been a great, great conversation over the screen, but it's nothing, nothing like we're actually meeting up with with Absolutely. people in the real world. I hope to do that someday. I hope the audience will get forward to do that. You. You. Yes, thank you so much, Sharad, for doing thank this. Thank you to everyone for listening thank and putting you. up Take with care. this. Take care. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.